Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today for our traffic online meetup. My name is Patricia Dugan, and we are so happy you're here. Um, let's see, I have a few things to tell you before we get going. Um, Patricia Dugan is my name here. We have traffic on Twitter, and we have uh, my Twitter handle as well. Um, what uh, traffic I do, uh, I'm a director of community marketing over at uh, for Containus and, and I create uh, marketing initiatives to help our developer pool um, and users of traffic uh, have an easier time and learn from each other. Um, traffic online meetups are specifically created to bring you use cases and ways other users are uh, answering technical challenges or doing unique and creative things with traffic in their own deployment. So um, let us know if you have anything you want us to talk about. A couple of things before we get started that I want you to know about. Um, ways to know what we're up to, where we'll be, uh, news on us, blog posts that we're writing about version 2.0 or traffic EE. Um, is to follow us on Twitter and follow us on LinkedIn if you don't use Twitter. And second, uh, we are looking for a United States-based developer advocate. We are a distributed team and would love if you ping us if you're interested. I will throw these links in the chat box for you later. Um, and finally, the next one, we, the next meetup we have coming up is on the 27th, and that's going to be someone you probably all both know and love, Brian Christner of 56K Cloud. He is a Docker captain. He is an awesome dude. Um, and he is going to talk about some really cool stuff. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Grafana and Prometheus and, and how to use metrics um, with traffic. Um, Let's see. Today we have someone awesome. Uh, it's Colin Dembowski. He is the scribe of a stellar blog about DevOps. Um, and I'm going to leave you in the chat box a link to his DevOps series. Uh, things you need to know about him. He is originally from South Africa. He is an amazing cook, chef, um, as I know from Twitter. And um, and then, um, so we get to hear what he's doing and who he is when he starts sh starts the show. Um, and please, uh, we totally encourage you to ask all questions you'd like to do. I'm extremely excited to watch his uh, demos around Canary um, deployments. And so uh, don't hesitate to add questions in the chat box and Colin is going to answer them and share a whole bunch of cool stuff with us. So that's really all I have to talk about. If you want to get in touch with me, um, ping me on the chat box or ping me on Twitter. And other than that, traffic is grateful that you're here and we are stoked uh, for this show. And now we're going to turn it over to Colin Dombowski. Thank you so Bye. much, Patricia. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, so I've, I, um, I'm a solution architect with a company called 10th Magnitude. Uh, which I'll intro a little bit uh, later. I'm, I'm, I'm very Microsoft focused in, in the technology that I work with, uh, but I do love open source and uh, have, have several GitHub repos, so I'm no stranger to open source. And of course, Microsoft's now the cool kid again uh, with, uh, with their purchase of GitHub and with their contributions to open source. So it's, it's just an exciting time to be involved in Microsoft technologies, especially because of the the, uh, in, in the way that Microsoft has embraced open source technology. Uh, but my, my blog is collinsalmcorner.com, which started off really as a diary that I could use to help myself uh, remember things that I'd solved or things, things that were interesting to me. And uh, the way I hooked up with traffic was I started thinking about container DevOps and what, what is unique about doing DevOps with container, containerized workloads. And I, I started writing a blog post series called Container DevOps and traffic was one of the stars of the show as I started investigating some of the tools that are out there and some of the capabilities. And so that's how I got introduced to Patricia and the containers team and, uh, and they're just a fantastic crowd. So it's great to be on this webinar. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So I just, I wanted to put this slide up to, to tell a little bit about Tense Magnitude because I think it, it's relevant to today's webinar. Um, so Tense Magnitude, we're 100% Azure as far as cloud platform goes. So we don't do any work 
uh, in AWS or Google Cloud or any other cloud platform. We're 100% Azure focused. Having said that, uh, we were Microsoft's open source application and infrastructure partner of the year in 2018. So our engineers do a lot of work with open source technologies. So we're partners with Chef, HashiCorp and, and other, other pretty popular um, open source companies. So, um, so we've got a good mix of, uh, of Microsoft and open source uh, expertise. Uh, and uh, this earlier this week or late last week, we were named the Microsoft Global DevOps and Data Center Migration Partner of the Year for 2019. So, uh, so that's a that's a great award to get. And um, and we just we're passionate about DevOps, passionate about helping companies succeed with DevOps. And and again, that's where that's where this uh, this topic of how do how do companies actually do DevOps with containers and what's unique about that situation is really what sparked that. The series and my my um, my experimentation into into traffic. So uh, I wanted to put this slide up. I'm not going to cover it in too much detail because I want to get to the demos. But um, I, I, as I started thinking about what's unique about container DevOps and what I what I think teams and organizations need to be doing for DevOps with containers, I, ha I had some thoughts that these are just kind of thoughts about DevOps uh, in in. Uh, in general terms, right? So not talking about the tools or the stacks or anything like that, but just talking in, in terms of what practices, what, what thinking should teams have around containers uh, and DevOps. So building quality is very, is very critical. Uh, and I've seen this over my career as an, as an app application developer, how important it is to have unit testing and to have the kind of shift left mentality where, where we're able to uh, decrease cycle time. So if we test while we, as we're committing code in, if we can get tests running there and find errors there, that's much better than waiting until we get bugs in production. So this whole shift left mentality is, is something that's critical for teams and is important for container DevOps too. So, and there's, there's some unique challenges like uh, running, running tests in your Docker file is great, but how do you actually extract those test results and publish them in some format that you can do some analysis and so there, there's some definitely some unique challenges in the in the container space, um, building secure uh, or building building um, security checks into your container images, uploading those images to secure repos, uh, using Sonar Cube or any other kind of tool for technical deck tracking. Those are all things that are important around quality. Uh, then environment isolation, isolating dev test and production environments. Um, of course, namespaces is something critical in, in the Kubernetes world for being able to separate out environments. Um, you know, when, when, do you, when do you have a separate dev test and production cluster or when do you use namespaces and, and, you, and utilize the same, the same underlying infrastructure and save on costs by sharing that infrastructure? That's something teams have to work through and think about. Uh, canary testing, which is something we'll see a lot today in the demos. How do you do canary testing or testing in production? Uh, how do you actually um, limit, limit exposure, but actually get production metrics in as you're, as you're rolling out changes in your software? Uh, that, of course, would be pretty useless if you didn't have any way of monitoring your application. So how do you monitor, how do you produce, consume, and analyze metrics from your applications, from your containers, from Kubernetes itself? Uh, these are things that teams need to think about. And of course, security, securing your services, uh, making sure that there is least privilege on on service accounts and and access to to your clusters and so on all of the all of the good stuff that we need to build in and bake into our to our software delivery process the earlier we build it in the better we're going to be in the long run and then resiliency how do you do zero downtime deployments especially because uh, you know uh, an interesting statistic from the state of devops report from 2017 was that high performing teams are deploying 46 times more frequently than lower performing peers. So a lot of companies are getting down to their, you know, they can deploy multiple times a day, but when you've got all these deployments going, how do you do it in such a way that you don't actually disrupt your services as you're doing your deployment? How do you do things like throttling or circuit breakers to make sure that you don't have cascading failures throughout your microservices architecture? So these are things that, that teams need to be thinking about. And then of course, infrastructure as code and configuration as code. Uh, getting getting as much automated as we can and putting that into code repositories for for traceability and and for for governance. Uh, so these are things that that I, I've got a I've got a blog post about those about those things. So that's about all I'm going to say about that. But really, as I was thinking about these things in relation to containers, that's how I came across 
across traffic, especially in the canary testing and resiliency um, aspects here, traffic, traffic's just been a phenomenal tool to work with. So uh, then I wanted to, the other half of this uh, title is Azure DevOps. So we're, we're, doing, we're doing a container DevOps with traffic and Azure DevOps. And so I realized this, uh, that the, the, uh, the audience here might, might not be that familiar with Azure DevOps. So I wanted to put this slide up just to show some of the capabilities of Azure DevOps. Azure DevOps used to be called Visual Studio Team Systems or Team Services. And before that, it was Visual Studio Online, and it was also a Team Foundation server. So Microsoft uh, have definitely iterated some names on this product. But this is, this is the um, backbone of, of Microsoft's, Azure, uh, Microsoft's DevOps platform. Um, the name Azure DevOps is good and bad. It's great because it is, it is running in Azure. So it is running on a, on a, on a world standard uh, platform. So uh, it, is, it is definitely scalable to thousands of developers globally distributed. Um, but it also unfortunately has this connotation that you have to be in Azure to use Azure DevOps. So I wanted to make it clear that that's not the case. Um, you can definitely be deploying to AWS or on-premises data centers or Google Cloud or wherever using Azure DevOps. Um, Azure DevOps is also, the, you'll see the, um, all the demos I'm doing today, I'm running on Linux agents for, for deploying to to clusters in Azure, to uh, Azure Kubernetes Services, AKS clusters, but uh, there are Mac OS, Linux and Windows agents. So it's, it's fully cross-platform. And one of the things the team likes to say all the time is any cloud, any platform, any language. And so it's really a phenomenal tool. Um, these are the, the main features of Azure DevOps. There's Azure Boards, which is kind of like Jira. Uh, so you get work item tracking where you can have um, your work items as backlogs or as boards. You can roll them up and, and have portfolio level views across multiple teams. So some great features for work item tracking. There's Azure repos, which is really just Git. All right, this is not some Microsoft flavor of Git. It is just a Git remote that you can push Git repos to. Uh, Azure DevOps also integrates very tightly with GitHub and that's that, um, that integration is getting tighter all the time. So you can, you can have your Azure, you can have Azure uh, boards with work items that refer to, to code that's in, in GitHub and you can see commits on your work items and you can uh, transition your work items on the board automatically with certain keywords in your commit messages. So there's, there, there's tighter and tighter integration there. Again, uh, especially since the acquisition, which happened uh, about a year ago somewhere around that time that Microsoft actually acquired GitHub. And so there's, there's a lot tighter integration between those two tools. So you can certainly have your repos in GitHub and still use Azure DevOps for other features like Azure Pipelines, which you'll see a lot of in the demo today. Azure Pipelines, CI, CD system, any language, any platform, any cloud. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll show that to you. Uh, there's also Azure test plans for, for doing manual testing and, and uh, managing your manual testing efforts as well as Azure Artifacts, which is for package management, whether it's NPM, Maven, um, even universal packages where you can just package anything you want to, any arbitrary set of files you can package into, into some kind of versioned uh, package that you can then use in downstream or, or for deployments or whatever. So uh, pretty, pretty impressive tool. Uh, it, it does work better together in a lot of senses, but you can also plug and play. So you can still have builds that run in Jenkins and do releases through Azure pipelines, for example, or you can have your work items in Jira and still have your repos in Azure, in Azure DevOps. So there's a lot of plug and play kind of um, capabilities as well. Uh, but I wanted to show you, I wanted to put the slide up just to, just to give, give everyone a, an overview of what Azure DevOps is. One particular feature that I wanted to highlight here is Azure Pipelines. So this, this was a screen grab I did from the, the URL at the top of the slide uh, from the GitHub Marketplace. So if you go to github.com slash marketplace slash Azure Pipelines, you can create an Azure Pipeline. Or you can install this plugin onto your repo. If you have an open source repo, you get up to 10 parallel free, jo free jobs with unlimited minutes, right? So that means you get completely free hosted build capabilities for your open source repo, and you can run up to 10 parallel jobs for free. And like I said, there's Linux, Mac OS, and Windows agents. So 
if you if you need to have a build server for your open source projects and you do then uh, azure pipelines is fantastic because you you get that for free and uh and it's it's got some amazing capabilities it's probably one of my favorite features out of azure devops is is the azure pipelines feature so traffic what is what is traffic well traffic as i started looking at container devops i wanted a way to do canary testing uh, to be able to shift traffic and and have uh, multiple copies of a service and be able to route traffic uh, to different um, to different services so I could do blue green testing um, and I wanted it I wanted it to be something that you could do very easily without a lot of overhead um, without a lot of cognitive load um, so I compared I compared three tools I, com I started I started looking at Istio and got got a demo working with Istio but felt Istio was very heavy and, and to be fair it, uh, Istio is much more than just a, a, a router it, it does it has a, a very deep set of capabilities, but I felt it was very heavy for what I wanted to do. So then I started investigating Linkerd. Uh, Linkerd, I had some success with Linkerd, uh, but when I when I investigated traffic for doing canary testing and uh, and things like circuit breakers, I just found I found traffic was just such a intuitive tool. Uh, it was it felt very lightweight but very powerful, and so. Um, in in this container DevOps series here, I've got a bitly link to it on this slide. Um, that uh, I have a really detailed post comparing those three tools uh, in terms of container DevOps. And, and again, I know that it's not necessarily apples for apples because they, they have different feature sets, but in terms of just doing canary deployments and circuit breakers and traffic shifting and so on, I found traffic just to be a really phenomenal tool for that. Um, and so I'll, I'll show you how, how I uh, Im implemented that uh, to, to get canary testing into into an Azure DevOps pipeline. All right, so I wanted to put this diagram up here. Um, I'm, I'm only going to scratch the surface on on uh, on the setup for this demo because there's a lot of moving pieces. But uh, on the on the front end here, uh, I, well, uh, this main block here is an Azure Kubernetes service or AKS cluster. It's just a Kubernetes cluster. It happens to be hosted in Azure, but that's really not important for for the demo today, I have an AKS cluster. Uh, I mean, I have a, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, I have a load balancer, so this could be an Amazon load balancer if I was if I was hosting in Amazon. Uh, but I've got an Azure load balancer with a public DNS address, and I install and configure um, a, the traffic services, and I, I configure a traffic ingress for what what I call external traffic. So I've actually got two traffic controllers. One that uh, is is the entry point into the cluster from external traffic and one that I use for, for routing internal traffic that's not exposed outside of the cluster at all. And so the external ingress controller is configured to, to hook up to that Azure load balancer uh, and through using a, a couple of lines of YAML, uh, traffic also generates a, a Let's Encrypt certificate for me. And so I have, I have a certificate generated for that so that I have, I have a secure site. And that's, that's just done with a couple lines of, of uh, configuration in YAML. And then that ingress controller, I'm, I'm, I, have a, I have a front end service, which is just a web application. And uh, I've, I've got two versions of it deployed. One, one I call a green version and one I call a blue version. And I'm routing, again, just using some simple annotations, which I'll show you to route 80% of traffic that comes into that ingress to hit the service will go to the green service and 20% will go to the blue. So I'm able to split the traffic. And when I do deployments, I first deploy to the blue service, my new version of my application. And then I monitor metrics through Prometheus and Grafana. And then if, if I see that the blue deployment is successful or that there's better performance or whatever it is that I'm trying to measure and trying to learn through this experiment, then I can promote that service over into the green service as well. And so that'll, that'll let me uh, roll out totally to the entire service. Otherwise, if, if I'm after monitoring the blue service, I see that things are not working as I expect, then I can roll back just that blue portion and I'm only exposing 20% of my traffic to that new version. So, uh, and of course that could be a very, a much smaller number if I wanted, if I wanted less exposure. So I'm able to use, the traffic ingress and some simple annotations to do this traffic shifting. 
And then I do the same thing for internal traffic. The, the internal services call an API, which is also sitting behind my internal ingress uh, traffic controller. And that's able to also route and, uh, and do canary testing on my APIs as well. So I have, I have the traffic ingress controller for external with a TLS certificate through Let's Encrypt. And I have an internal one. And both of those controllers allow me to do traffic shifting uh, so that I can have zero downtime deployments and progressive exposure on, on new versions of my code. So what does that look like? So this is a, a snippet of, um, of, a, of a YAML file that I use in my pipeline to deploy traffic. So when I, when I, deploy, um, when I deploy traffic out, I configure traffic, um, and this is the external traffic controller. So I've got, I've got two files, one, one for the internal, one for the external, but I'm, I'm installing it via Helm. So I'm just doing a Helm install or a Helm upgrade and passing in this YAML file with some values that I override. So a couple of things I wanted to point out here is at the top is the load balancer IP. Uh, so this is the IP address that, that, um, that traffic needs for generating the uh, Let's Encrypt certificate. Uh, I've got this ingress class here, uh, oops. This ingress class PU dev traffic external. Uh, and whenever I deploy an ingress, and I'll show you what the ingress looks like in the next couple slides, I can, I can tell that ingress that I want this particular ingress controller, this class to be controlled by this one. So we're going to an external and an internal traffic controller. And so I use the ingress class to kind of divide the uh, ingress address space is kind of the way I think about it. And so, so I've defined what class of uh, ingresses this particular controller is going to is going to monitor and then you can see under ssl i've got enabled is true enforced is true and a permanent permanent redirect is true so these are all settings that i can tweak and then there's an acme setting and acme is is just the settings for uh for the let's encrypt certificate generation uh so i've enabled i've enabled that and i've put an email address in and under the domains list i've put the dns address of my load balancer Right, so, uh, so I create the load balancer, get the IP address at the top, get the DNS entry uh, under the domains list here, and that's all the traffic needs to generate a TLS certificate for that external traffic controller. Uh, and then a couple of other features here, gzip enabled is true, so that will, that will zip up the, uh, the contents of packets on the wire for me, so I get, I get a little bit more performance there and RBAC enabled, uh, that's, that's a role-based access control. So uh, enable that as well, just to help with security. And so uh, not too much to do to get, uh, to get an ingress controller that can handle traffic for me and that actually creates a certificate for me for my site, which, which I'll show you. So, uh, so very cool. Again, this is one of the things I love about traffic is just how simple it is to set things up. Uh, it's very intuitive, uh, but yet very powerful uh, and the configuration is, is very straightforward. There's nothing here that's really too, uh, too intimidating. All right, then uh, in terms of the ingress, so an ingress is, is a, a native Kubernetes construct. And again, it's one of the things I love about traffic is that it doesn't have a ton of custom resource definitions or CRDs. Uh, it, it uses uh, just really native uh, Kubernetes constructs. I know traffic two has got one or two custom resource definitions, which is fine. It, um, unlike uh, Istio, which has, I think, 39, or uh, they've got a ton of custom resource definitions, so it um, can be a, a little bit heavy to, to keep a handle on. But one of the things I love about traffic is that it's, it kind of feels very lightweight and very intuitive, right? And so uh, there's two sections I want to highlight here on this ingress. So this is the ingress for my Parts Unlimited website. And uh, this is just, again, like this is an ingress just like I would define if I was using an Nginx ingress. There's nothing very specific here about the ingress other than the, the traffic.ingress.kubernetes.io annotations. Um, so the first annotation here, I remember I said I've got an internal and an external ingress controller. And so I tell the ingress which controller should handle the traffic for that ingress. And so this is just making sure I match the class that I defined on the ingress controller to the class on the ingress. And that lets me, lets me have multiple ingress controllers on my cluster and still divide that kind of ingress address space. 
And then you'll see the traffic ingress Kubernetes IRS service weights annotation. Um, and I'm telling the, the, just by the annotation here, I'm saying I want 20% of my traffic to go to the blue service or blue backend and 80% to go to the green backend. And then just below that section after the labels, uh, you'll see that in, in the spec, there's a, a set of rules and I have the host. Again, this is the DNS entry for the load balancer. And then I have the backends configured where I have uh, the blue backend and the, and the green backend and defining which ports those go to. So those will point to, to the two services uh, that I've deployed. Again, just native Kubernetes services with their underlying deployments and pods. Uh, this could be, um, you know, just as long as I've got a service, it doesn't really matter what's under that service, whether it's, whether it's, uh, whether it's deployments or replica sets or whatever is, is immaterial as long as I'm, I'm just routing traffic here from the ingress to the correct services. And so this, this is how I specify that 80, 20 traffic splits uh, between the services that I have. On the service itself, uh, this is again, just a purely native service definition. Uh, purely native Kubernetes service definition. The only thing I've added really is an annotation here. And again, you can see traffic in the annotation namespace here, traffic.backend.circuitbreaker, network error ratio greater than 0 0.2. So if, if we have less than 80% success rate on traffic to this particular service, then I've told traffic to actually remove this service and not send any more traffic to this service. So again, just if I want a circuit breaker, for my for a service, uh, if and a, if a service goes down, I want the circuit breaker to cut it out of the traffic loop so that I don't get cascading failures. Uh, that's very very simple to do if you're backing your services, uh, or if you're fronting your services, I should say, with with traffic because you can just define this um, circuit breaker annotation and uh, and network error ratio is just one of the options that you have for circuit breaking. Uh, but this one is just going to monitor the network ratio the network errors and if there's more than 80 percent errors uh, it will cut that service out and will not serve any more traffic to that service so really simple to put circuit breakers into your to your microservices so that's it for slides um, i'm going to switch over to my demo i wanted to pause and see patricia are there any questions that i can answer or well um, I don't see any that have come in yet. Maybe we could start the live demo part because that's when people start getting juiced up. Good, absolutely. So let me let me do that. All right. So um, what I'm looking at here is Azure DevOps. Uh, let me show you the parts unlimited websites that I have up, uh, and then I'll come back to Azure DevOps and the and the actual release pipelines. Um, so here I have. Um, I've gone to my dev uh, cluster or my dev, dev namespace. So actually, I've got dev and prod namespaces uh, in, in the same cluster. Uh, and so I do actually have two external uh, traffic controllers, one in the dev namespace, one in the prod namespace. And this is just the URL for, that, for the load balancer on the dev side. And that routes me to the development sites. And you can see on the development sites, um, the discount here for oil is 25.67%, all right? So this is just an e-commerce site. Uh, the, the source code for this is, is, on, is on GitHub. It's a .NET application, but that's really immaterial for this demo. This could be, this could be a Python app, a Node.js app. It could be an Angular app. It doesn't really matter, all right? Um, but you can see here how this discount says 2567 so if I then go over to the production site and look at that same banner, you'll see it's 22.67%, right? So I've done a deployment to the dev environment already. And again, I didn't want this to be a coding demo. This is not about the code change, but the point is that there is a change that our developers have made to the website. I wanted that to be something very simple and very visible, right? So 25% for the discount on the dev site and 22% on the on the production site and you can see we've we've probably deployed out to dev already because dev is different from production all right and then um, and then i have i have grafana and prometheus this um this grafana chart is is showing every time a customer adds a, a product into their cart i i track that as an event in my prometheus metrics so this is giving me a chart of how many 
um, how many items are being purchased in different categories uh, for our website. So you'll see that we've got this green, green section here in this bar chart on the right is for batteries, the yellow ones for brakes, then we've got lighting, oil and wheel and tires is the red section. So um, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of business telemetry. And again, in my blog posts, you'll see, you'll see I refer to telemetry that's not specific to requests per second or IO or, or anything like that, but is really business metric specific. Um, so, uh, so this is really a, a business metric dashboard where, where I have some kind of proxy metric that's showing me how many items we're selling in which category. All right. And so if I go and look at the pipelines, uh, what I'm looking at here is, is the release pipeline for, for the website. And there's, there's two builds here. There's a 10046 build, which is, you can look, you can see here, it's deployed out to the production blue stage and the production green stage. So I've got multiple stages in this pipeline here. I've got a dev stage and there's only a single dev stage, but for production, there's two, there's actually a third one for, for rolling back if we, if we wanna roll back the blue deployments, but I have a stage representing deploying to the blue canary and a stage representing deployment to the green. And so looking at what's currently deployed, I can see 10046 is deployed to the production slots and 10048 is deployed to the dev slot, which kind of makes sense because there's two different versions of the website, which we can see through that, the, the discount and the oil banner at the home page, we can see we can see that there's different versions. So I've already run this deployment for 10048, that's a build number, and I've already deployed that to the dev environment. Um, so what I wanna do is um, I'm gonna click onto that deployment, and here you can see the release designer. Uh, we can see that development has succeeded, and then it's waiting on deployment to, to the blue slot, and so I'm gonna just deploy that uh, it'll take a few minutes to do the deployments. So I wanted to start that before I actually dig into the actual release itself. And you can see that after I, after I hit deploy there, I just had a manual trigger. You can have automated triggers as well, but the, it's sitting now on what's called an approval. So I have to find a, a, a manual approval for this particular stage. And so this, this would let us have automation go to deploy to the dev environment, run any tests, any integration tests, do whatever quality controls we want in dev, trigger automatically to the, to the blue um, stage or to the production stage, but we may wanna just have a manual uh, approval set there. And this is something you can define that's optional, so you don't have to have these manual gates, but if there's any kind of manual check that you wanna do or manual sign off that you wanna do, you can build that into the pipeline with these approvals. So I'm gonna click approve. And I, I can either start the automation into that environment or that stage right now if I hit approve, or I can defer that later and say, you know what, I'm going to approve it now, but I only want to deploy at midnight tonight. And I could set that as a, as a deferred time, but I'm just going to hit approve now. And so that's going to spin up an agent for me. I'm using hosted agents here. So that'll spin up a hosted agent for me, uh, which is configured to go and do the deployment to my, to my cluster. All right. And I click on logs, we can actually follow the logs as the agent runs in real time. Uh, we can see it cloning the repo that has some of my deployment scripts and it'll start running through uh, all of those, all of the tasks that I've defined for this particular stage, right? So this is kind of an orchestration engine and I've defined a set of steps that should, that should be run and, and I can see it going, I can watch those logs uh, real time. Uh, but What's, what I want to get back to while that's going, it'll take a couple of minutes, is that on the left-hand side, we can see that this was manually triggered. We can see which version of the application. It's 10048. Uh, and if I click on that, that'll take me to the build that was, that was run. And if I look at this build summary, uh, I can see some interesting things. Right? Firstly, I can see that there's a 100% pass rate on the tests. Right? So if I click on that, uh, it'll show me it'll show me the test results and let me filter this it by default only shows failed tests and there weren't any but here are the 22 unit tests that I'm running as part of the as part of building that docker container so I've got a multi-stage docker container uh, a docker build file in the in the build and it's running some tests and I'm extracting those tests and publishing it so that the test results are visible on 
the build summary report. And there's also code coverage. So I can click over here on the code coverage report and here I can see all of the coverage for all of the classes within, within my application that are being covered with my unit tests. Or in this case, there's a lot that's not covered, right? So, uh, so I, I'm, getting, I'm getting test and, um, and code coverage as part, of my, um, as part of my build. I can then go and click on the job to look at the logs. All right, so this is, these are the logs here. So let me go to uh, build the image, right? So this is where, this is the step that's actually, you can see the output here is the output that I would get if I ran Docker build against my, my build file, right? And so it's running on the agent and it's running through the, the, Docker build, the Docker build file and then pushing my image to my container registry, which happens to be on, on Azure, Azure container registries. And then my deployments can then deploy uh, from that container registry. Uh, but again, this doesn't have to be targeting Azure. This could be targeting whatever. All right. So I can, I can see some information about the build. Uh, what's also interesting about this is that I can see which changes were coming. So if I click on that changes link, that'll take me to my repository. Now this repository happens to be in Azure DevOps. Um, it's just a Git repo, right? If there's nothing specific to Microsoft or Azure or anything like that, it's just a Git repo. This could be, this could just as easily have been a GitHub repo or a Bitbucket repo or any other kind of Git, Git based repo. Um, but these are the, these are the commits that came in since the previous build, which was the 10046 build. And so I can see exactly which code is changed between those builds and which is incoming into the release that's currently running. All right, so we've got, we've got traceability to the code. And then finally, we've got traceability to the work items because there's also a work item linked. And so if I click on that, that's gonna take me to the work item, which you can see is called containers discount demo. And so um, this was, this was a, a work item that was logged onto our backlog and uh, and the team was able to prioritize that and move it through its states and we could we could do reporting on how long it took to implement this user story we can get lead and cycle times through widgets and so on so uh, again i just wanted to highlight that there's this traceability from the code back to the work item tracking through the build and we've got tests integrated so we're getting this end-to-end -end view which again is something that's that's pretty critical for for high performing DevOps teams is to have this end to end view. What code is coming in? Why is it coming in? Where is this work tracked? How are the tests doing? How do we have quality controls around this? Uh, these are all things that we can we tie together with Azure DevOps. So now we know what what the what code is coming in. Uh, we know why it was coming in from the work item, and so let's go back to the release. All right, and if I hit refresh here, you'll see that it's just succeeded, right? So that, uh, that job completed. And again, I can look at all the logs. Um, so here is a Helm upgrade website. So I've got a Helm package for deploying my web application and I, I run the Helm upgrade to, to go and update to the newest version, uh, which is again, the 10048 is coming in. And then I actually start a, a load test job. I've got a job that's, that's running, that's simulating some traffic, right? So in, of, of course you wouldn't actually do this in the real world, but for my demo purposes, I wanted to, demo, I wanted to um, generate some traffic against that deployment so that we can see what the difference is. So I'm gonna switch over to Grafana and I'm gonna make sure, so I'm just port forwarding Grafana locally. I wanna make sure that that port forward is running. So I don't expose my metrics uh, publicly. I'm just using port forwarding to get to it. And then, all right, so here we can see the metrics for the last few minutes. Um, and you can see here that if I go to the, uh, let's see, I'm gonna go to the oil category. Um, and let's see here. All right, so you can see that there was the spike about uh, three minutes ago where we suddenly started selling a lot more oil uh, products and that correlates to the discount, the higher discounts on our production site. So if I go back to the production site, we used to have a 22% discount. We then deployed and okay, that's still saying 22 because I'm hitting the uh, canary, All right? So only, let's see if I can actually get it to refresh here. 
Am I not? Oh, there it is. Okay. So only 20% of the traffic that's going to our production site is getting the 25% discount. But if we look at the metrics, we can see that there's a spike in the amount of products in that oil category that were purchased. So we've, uh, we've done a canary deployment to a small subset of our production, uh, production environments, only 20% of that traffic, but we can see from our telemetry that this is successful. All right, now again, it's a, it's a little, bit, little bit forced because I'm doing that through a load test, but again, that this, this is just showing how, how important metrics are if you're doing any canary testing. Uh, is to actually have some metrics that will tell you if the canary is successful or not. Um, so we've looked at those metrics uh, and we're, we're happy that this is, that this is actually um, successful. And so uh, we can go back to the release. Let me go back to the pipeline here. And now I'm gonna just approve the prod green stage, which is then going to roll out that version of the website to the green slot as well so that now 100% of the traffic will be on the new version rather than only 20% on the new version. Uh, in the bottom left here you can see this prod blue revert which is the automation to go and essentially do a rollback so that the blue goes back to the older version if, if the experiment was not successful. So that's at the, that's at the higher level there. Uh, Patricia, is there a question? Yeah, a question. Um, it's about source code. If someone's yep. source code is in GitHub, can they use Azure repos? Yes, absolutely. So I've, I've got, um, I've got my, my pipeline and my, my builds hooked up to, to Azure repos. Uh, but let me, let me show you here. I'm just going to come to pipelines. Let me see if I can do it from this UI. And if I hit new pipeline, uh, you can see there's a, there's a number of options here for where does your source code reside. So the, the top one is Azure repos Git. Uh, then there's Bitbucket Cloud, but you can see GitHub or GitHub Enterprise are, are first class citizens as far as Azure DevOps is concerned. Other Git would just be any other generic Git repository, but you can also hook up to Subversion or Team Foundation version control, which is the centralized version control system that Azure DevOps supports. But certainly GitHub or GitHub Enterprise are first class citizens here. Um, I can actually show you. So I want to show two things. Uh, I want to show the, um, the release, right? So I, I like to get teams to think of deploying their applications in two stages. First one is build, and that is going to compile your code run any unit tests, any tests that don't require an environment, so anything that's mocked or, or faked so that you can actually, you can run pure unit tests, um, do integration with Sonar Cube, any kind of quality controls, um, scanning your, your images as you're creating container images, that should all be part of your build process. And the output of that should be a deployable, potentially deployable package, whether that's uh, a new get package or a Maven package, or in, in this case, uh, a, um, an, an image, a, a container image that's deployable. And then once you've, once you've done that in the build phase, then the release phase is then going to be environment aware and you're going to push that, those binaries through your, through your environments. In this case, we've got dev first, then we do canary to the blue slot on production and then we go into uh, full, full production with the, with the green slot. So, so what I'm showing you here is the release part, which assumes that we've, we've got a completed build. We've got some kind of package again with container DevOps. That's typically an image and this is how we get it deployed through. So I'm going to start showing you what's under the hood here. And then I'll go back to the YAML file. I have a YAML file that specifies how the agent should build the image in the first place from my, from my source code. All right. So let me edit the pipeline here. All right, and so in, in the PU dev stage, so this is just a, a, a stage is just a group of tasks that are targeting a namespace in this case, right? But there's, there's nothing really special about it. It's just a way of grouping these things. So, um, but I've got two jobs. And if I look at the job here, I'm running this job on the hosted Ubuntu 1604 image. So this, uh, when, I, when this job is initiated by, by me, um, queuing this release, it will spin up a, a, a hosted Ubuntu 1604 agent and that agent will run through the tasks. So what tasks are going to do in this case, it's using Azure CLI to create an image pool secret. 
Um, you'll see here under Azure subscription, once it actually refreshes here, uh, that I have an, a number of um, what's called service endpoints. And so this is the authentication I need against my particular, uh, against some kind of resource that I need to authenticate against. In this case, it's, it's credentials to authenticate to my Azure subscription. Um, you'll see, I'll show you what, the, what that looks like when you're targeting a, a, a Kubernetes cluster. You can set up credentials for, for that using a, using a service principle. And again, that kind of abstracts away the authentication from the author. So an, an administrator could set up that authentication and a release author just says, I need to use that connection. I don't need to know the details for that connection. So it's great for, great for um, kind of governance and, and for uh, accountability and so on. But here you can see I'm just, I've got a shell script. And so I'm just executing that shell script in the context of this uh, authenticated endpoint against my subscription. And so this is going to use the Azure um, CLI to go and uh, go and extract some information and create, a, create an image secret in my cluster from that. Uh, and then once it's done that, I've got this task group. So I'll go and manage the task group. So the task groups allow me to group a set of tasks together because I'm going to use that same task group in a number of environments. So I don't want to have to maintain it uh, all over the place. So I've grouped this, what, eight or 10 tasks here. Um, so here's create or update a public IP for the load balancer. So um, I like to have my releases be item potent so I can run this the first time, I can run this subsequent times. And if the public IP exists, it's just gonna do a no op. If it doesn't exist, it will go and create that. Um, I'm extracting the green tag, right? So um, if, I, if I look at my um, services and my, my pods that have been deployed, I want to get the green tag. I'm using the build number as the green tag. Uh, and so this is really the old build number and I need that for, for the Helm, uh, for the Helm deployment. I've got a Helm chart that deploys both the blue and the green versions of my application. So both canaries. And so I don't want to mess with the green version. So I go and extract that green version and make sure that I don't mess with that when I'm updating the blue version. All right. Then I replace some tokens. I've got some tokenized files and I replace some, replace some, uh, tokens and then I'm uh, doing a Helm install again. If Helm exists already, this is really just a no op. Um, and then I'm uh, doing whatever I need to deploy my application. So in this case, I've got SQL 2017 running in a container as part of the solution. So that's being deployed. And then I'm invoking the Helm chart for my web application um, and and giving it the so here's here's that uh, authentication for my um, my Kubernetes cluster. Oh, let me show you what that looks like, just so you can see what that authentication looks like. Again, this is defined sort of outside of the release. And if I go and update that service connection, uh, in this case, it's because it's an AKS cluster, uh, I'm able to authenticate with uh, Azure Active Directory and a service principle, but you can also just create a generic uh, connection to a Kubernetes cluster. All right, so if I go to Kubernetes, I can either dump in a cube config file here, or I can specify a service account and it'll tell me how to create that service account in the cluster. Uh, and, uh, and I have to specify the secret here, or I can use an Azure subscription and that'll connect to, to my Azure clusters. So uh, it doesn't really matter where your cluster is. Um, you can create a, you can create an authentication endpoint for that, that you can then consume in, inside of your pipelines to, to authenticate when you, when you're pushing changes to, to that cluster. All right, and then uh, I've got a task group for doing that load test just to simulate some traffic, right? So that's, that gives you, uh, again, I'm, I'm going very quickly here because there's, there's a lot here, but I hope I'm giving you some idea of, of how the pipelines are authored. Um, now, Azure DevOps recently released um, uh, a capability to specify this pipeline as a YAML file. Uh, it's pretty new still, so that you can't do the approvals. For example, the approvals are not are not in that YAML version of the CD files yet. Um, but the build itself is is a YAML file. All right. So the build YAML files have been part of uh, um, Azure DevOps for for a pretty long time. So I wanted to open that up to show you what that looks like. So again, I'm going to go to back to my build summary, and if I hit Edit Pipeline. This will open up the YAML file that specifies the tasks that I'm running to build my container image, right? So 
Um, let me increase my font a little bit here, make it a bit easier to see. All right, so the, there's a name setting here. So this is where it's 10046 or 10048 and so on. Uh, there's, there's a way to specify what name you want that build to have. And I'm just using uh, uh, like a semver as, as the build name. Uh, I can specify triggers. So for this particular build, um, if there's any, any commit that has changes in these paths within my repository should trigger this build. I can also filter on branches, right? So I could have a branch filter here that says uh, I only want to trigger on master or uh, branches that are in, you know sub uh, that have feature in their name, right? So we can specify branch branch triggers as well. So that'll be the trigger. Uh, the pool is which which agents to use. In this case, I actually want to want to do my builds uh, in. Uh, I've got a, a VSTS or an Azure DevOps agent pod actually running in my, in my Kubernetes cluster because I wanted to publish to SonarCube. So I've got SonarCube running in my cluster. And so that's why I'm doing a hosted agent. So I've, I've got some, I've got a script. Uh, there's a Helm chart for deploying Azure DevOps agents within a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so this is just telling this build to go and find an agent on that pool uh, which is sitting inside of my inside of my cluster. I've got some variables set up here, and then those variables are used in the tasks that that execute. So I've got a task called Docker One. All right. So on the right hand side here, if I want to add a new task, let me just get into a blank space. I've got this cool uh, YAML uh, helper here. So let me go to let me just search for Docker, so I can show you how we create that. Uh, so here's a Docker build image. And so I would fill out, here's a Docker registry. Here's my container re repository. Here's my command. It's a build and publish. You know, I get to fill out the, the fields for this task. And once I'm finished filling out this nice graphical form, I hit add and that'll insert the YAML for me. Of course, I can just author the YAML straight as well. Um, but each task has a number of inputs and uh, some, some configuration like continue on error. Uh, is set and so there, there's a there's a YAML schema for how you author these these pipelines and so I'm building and pushing the image in this case so that's a pretty simple one uh, there's more complicated ones uh, like the website one let me edit this one uh, this one is uh, getting IPs and uh, building images and then exporting files from the images that were built. So this is where I'm extracting the, uh, the, the test result files from the image, from an interim image. And then I'm using a publish test results task, publishing the, the test coverage as well, uh, and then pushing the image up to, up to the Azure Container Registry. But the, the, whole, the whole build is specified in this YAML file that lives in my repository. Um, so one more demo I wanted to show is, uh, and I'm going to drop down to my, to my, uh, consoles for this, if they'll wake up, there we go. All right. So in this case, I'm just port forwarding my, um, internal service. So I've got an API and, uh, the service it's, it's got a service in front of it and, uh, and I'm just port forwarding that local locally because that that uh, that service isn't actually exposed publicly. And then I've got a I've got a very simple .NET Core console application that's just going to do a call to a, a health endpoint on that service, and it's going to do it every hundred milliseconds. So that'll take a couple seconds to start up. Uh, while that's going, I want to. Uh, oops. out of this all right all right so you can see on, on this right hand top right hand side here uh, you can see that as I'm hitting that um, the, the traffic ingress controller for that API and telling it that I want traffic from this API so I'm using the traffic ingress controller essentially as a proxy I'm getting 20% of my traffic is going to the blue slot and 80% is going to the green slot so you can see that as as I get results back I'm spitting out that health result and that health 
that health um, endpoint knows whether it's on the blue canary or the green canary. And we can see it's version 10011. So I'm, I've got a, a Helm chart and I'm just going to update the blue slot. Here I've got a tag for which tag do I want to have deployed to the blue slot. And in this case, it's 10012 that I want to update for the blue slot. And so what I want to show is if I do a Helm upgrade now, uh, oops, not that one. Helm upgrade. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use Helm to upgrade now. In my release pipeline, I've automated this, but I wanted to show what happens when we do an upgrade. This is gonna upgrade the blue slot from version 11 to version 12. But if you if you see the the traffic that I'm getting here when I'm hitting that API, uh, there's gonna be no interruption in that in that at all. All right, uh, oops, I'm in the wrong folder. Do that. All right, so Helm is just completed. And so in a couple of seconds, we'll see that the blue, the blue slot will start returning 10012 instead of 10011 uh, because we've just upgraded and there it's just started. So you can see now that the blue slots are now on version 10012. And again, we've had no interruption to our service. So uh, that's given us zero downtime deployment. So that's a combination of the traffic um, uh, routing uh, with the annotations as well as just native um, deployments and and rollouts in in kubernetes using using native deployments to do to do upgrades to to services and pods in the cluster so now what i want to do is i want to delete the deployment on the blue slot right so this is i wanted to show how um, circuit breaking works um, so i'm going to just completely delete the deployment to the blue version of this api all right, so that's gonna be deleted completely. And now you can see all of the traffic that we're getting back is coming from the green slot, essentially because the circuit breaker kicked in and said, well, I'm not getting a reliable response from that blue slot, so I'm gonna circuit break it. And even though you've requested that 20% of traffic go to the blue slot, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ignore that instruction because the blue, the blue uh, slot is not healthy. All right, and then of course, I'll just do a helm again. Uh, just to redeploy that blue site and we should see uh, we should see the blue start popping up again with version 12 uh, in that and so so um, so that's a quick demo just to show zero downtime deployment and circuit breakers uh, in action with with traffic and kubernetes all right I, that's about it for my demo i've covered a lot of stuff so i'm gonna i'm gonna stop there for questions uh, but but thank you again for the opportunity Nice work. Yeah, this is super sweet. Um, there's one question uh, that came in that's important, I think. It's, uh, I have Jenkins builds, so I don't need Azure DevOps, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, again, like I, I, I try to get teams to think of build and deploy being as two separate processes, right? Uh, and Jenkins is, is a great tool for doing builds. It can be a little bit challenging to do deployments. Uh, and so in, in, in my experience, um, where, where teams have, are already using Jenkins to do their builds and to compile, test, and package their applications, they can still benefit from using Azure DevOps uh, for doing the releases, right? So I'll come back here to Azure DevOps. I wanna show, I wanna go to pipelines and create a new Actually, I don't want a new pipeline, I want a new release. Uh, but you'll see that when I, when I author a release, oops, I don't want to create, sorry, not create release, create new definition. That's what I wanted. I want a new release pipeline. So when I author a pipeline, I define what the incoming artifacts for that pipeline are. And Jenkins is one of the incoming Artifacts, so I can have a release that will push to various um, environments in my target cloud or on premises or different Kubernetes clusters and still consume artifacts that are being produced by Jenkins, right? So I'm just gonna create an empty job here. And if I hit add artifact, you can see under artifact types, uh, hopefully I've got it here somewhere, there's Jenkins, right? So. Uh, again, I would have to create a Jenkins service connection to connect to my, to authenticate to my Jenkins server. 
but then I would specify which job I want to suck artifacts from. All right. So I would have my list of Jenkins jobs here and I want to say, this is my um, parts unlimited website Jenkins job. And I want to grab the latest, um, the latest jobs artifacts from that. And then I can push that into my deployment pipeline and deploy wherever. So, so there's actually pretty good integration with, with Jenkins. So you don't have to convert over completely. Um, you can still use your Jenkins jobs to do the heavy lifting, uh, but have everything coordinated with Azure DevOps. Pretty sweet UI. I know we're at time, but this is a pretty sweet UI uh, this has, I believe. Um, and you did a, a wonderful job. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, after this, we will be uh, posting this to our YouTube channel. Um, and I, let's see, our YouTube channel, you can see it there, follow us on LinkedIn. And I will send a follow-up to all of our registrants to share with you uh, the video and our upcoming meetups. Um, you can find Colin at Colin Dembowski on Twitter um, and ask for all his cooking secrets and his DevOps secrets. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, Colin, so much for joining us and for your time and your expertise. It's been wonderful. Great. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, I guess we're done. Oh, and I do a virtual fist bump. Boom. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.